Great, good morning. I'm Michael Scharf. I'm the co-interim dean of the law school. Um, the other interim dean, Jessica Burke, who was slated to give these remarks is not available, but the wonderful thing about having two of us is that we're virtually interchangeable. So imagine me with longer hair. Um, on behalf of the law school community, it is a real privilege to welcome you to today's conference, the rhetoric of reproduction. And in addition to the crowd that we have assembled here, there are going to be several hundred viewers watching the live webcast. So when it's time for Q&A, please wait to get the microphone so that the viewers can hear what you're saying as well. I'd like to start by especially acknowledging the Law Med Center for organizing this fantastic symposium. And this year, it was our Associate Dean Jesse Hill who carried in organizing it. Thank you very much, Jesse. So. As most of you know, our Law Med Center was established over 50 years ago. It was the first of its kind in the country, and it has been consistently ranked among the top of the Law Med Centers of all the law schools in the country year after year after year. Several of the distinguished faculty associated with the center, including Associate Dean Hill, also Professor Rakaya Yerby, and the director of the Law Med Center, Max Melman, will be participating in this conference. I'd like to also say a special thank you to our co-sponsor, the Center for Reproduction Rights, for its general support. Thank you very, very much. This symposium, <laughs> this symposium will explore the ways in which courts, commentators, and advocates have framed reproductive rights rhetorically and doctrinally. The topic has been much in the news of late. Of course, everyone here has heard of the Hobby Lobby case, which dealt with employers' rights to avoid covering contraception for employees under the Affordable Care Act, a case which continues to reverberate. But there's also been recent battles over admitting privileges requirements for abortion providers throughout the country, which continue to raise about the extent to which proponents and opponents of legal access to abortion can claim the mantle of protecting women's health. We have a really impressive lineup of speakers today, including our keynote speaker, Professor Michelle Goodwin from the University of California at Irvine. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Max Melman, who holds several titles at our school and university, including Distinguished University Professor, the Arthur E. Peter Silge Professor of Law, and most importantly for our purposes today, the Director of the Law Medicine Center. Max. Thank you, Dean Scharf. Um, I just want to welcome you to uh, our law school, and I want to uh, thank uh, our distinguished panelists and moderators. I want to thank particularly my colleague, Jesse Hill, for putting together this remarkable uh, day. I want to thank Diana Horch from the Center for Reproductive Rights for helping to make this possible. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank the uh, administrative staff and students who you will see around you um, uh, and who are available if something uh, uh, needs to be done or goes wrong, just grab somebody. I'd also like to thank the editors of our health law journal, Health Matrix, which will be publishing papers commissioned from uh, the, the talks today. Um, uh, our current, uh, current editor-in-chief, Tim Mayer, and our, uh, coming, our upcoming editor-in-chief, Amy Letting. So uh, they will be uh, working with the uh, panelists who are submitting papers uh, throughout the next year, and uh, we expect that journal uh, volume to be ready uh, in about a year from now, right? Um, uh, it is especially uh, uh, apt that we have a program such as this here. Uh, you know, academic freedom, the ability to have uh, symposiums like this uh, is not uh, uh, something that uh, people enjoy around the world. Um, uh, given what some legislatures would like to do, it may not be something that people enjoy in public institutions in some of the states in this country. Uh, and yet, uh, this is what makes our country strong, um, and this is the beacon that we hold out to the world. Uh, so this is the 62nd year of the Law Medicine Center. Every year we do a, a conference or a symposium uh, such as this. Next year, uh, we're going to have one on wellness programs. The working title is Unwellness Programs. Uh, and I hope you will all come uh, and join us for that approximately the same time next year. So without more ado, I'd like to turn the program over to, uh, who's next? Uh, to Diana, sorry. Diana Horch, please. Thank you very much. Enjoy the day. Hi, everyone. 
everyone. Uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. Hi to everybody on the internet. That's very exciting. Um, I, whenever I get to talk to more than 100 people at a time, I feel very uh, blessed and grateful for the job that I have at the Center for Reproductive Rights. Um, so thank you so much to Professor Jesse Hill in the Law Medicine Center for inviting us to co-sponsor this day with them. Um, you know, what an amazing history the Law Medicine Center has. And um, my sort of portfolio at the Center for Reproductive Rights is really all about trying to make connections to the academy um, and to sort of pull the lens back from the advocacy work we do at the Center to think more about the larger issues, a little bit longer term, uh, and to move beyond disciplines and not just think law all the time. So it's really a pleasure, and this is probably the perfect partner for us, I think, in this venture. Um, thank you so much to the students uh, from the journal. It's exciting to be here, and we're so thrilled that you're going to be publishing the remarks. Uh, we want to thank all the participants who came today. We have such excellent panelists, and I'm sure Jesse will say more about that, so I won't go into any more detail. Um, and I want to thank my partners in crime from the Center for Reproductive Rights, Nicole Tuzinski and David, uh, who you'll be, David Brown, who you'll be hearing from later today. Um, so we're just thrilled to be doing this. I guess my the quick thought I have on the topic um, today was, um, you know, thinking about rhetoric and reproduction, it's, it's so, when I think about it, I think that really how we think and how we talk has such a close um, connection to how we advocate and how we regulate. Um, and certainly in my line of work where we do a lot of litigating domestically, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about the regulating and the advocating. And it's great to be able to pull back and think about how we talk, look at it a little bit more closely and broadly. So thank you very much. I'm Sarah Burns. Uh, I'm the faculty director of the Carr Center for Reproductive Justice at NYU School of Law. And my job today is to moderate the panel, uh, The Social Meanings of Parenthood and Reproduction. So as I'm talking, uh, our uh, panelists are making their way to their seat. And we are not going to spend much time with introductions because you have the inf information on each of our presenters online. And we'd like to give everybody a chance to really fill the time productively. Um, so with that as my very brief introduction, uh, our order of go today, just to remind everybody and make sure I'm, I'm on the same page with everybody. Where, uh, uh, Alyssa, where is Alyssa? <laughs> I, I'm about to say <laughs> that Alyssa Wolf is going to be our first, uh, the first person on our panel to talk, followed by Robin West and then Deborah Denner and uh, then Jennifer uh, Hendricks. Looking for uh, Alyssa. We are. Um, we could switch. We could switch. switch. You want to switch? Yeah. All right. So, uh, Robin. Okay. okay. <laughs> and we're I'm uh, we're giving panelists fifteen minutes with the uh, Adam and Louis Twenty. Okay. Does that work? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Should we stand? Or should we sit? You want to stand? Do you want to stand? I don't understand. Okay. Sorry. Okay, well thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, gee, oh, starting out. Okay, so I would like to talk this morning about two conceptions of heterosexual morality that I believe have had an outsized influence on in our discourse around reproductive rights. By conceptions of heterosexual morality, I mean understandings of the moral conditions of heterosexual activity. What must opposite sex, sex be in order for it to be moral? In the full version of this paper, I try to show that the two particular competing conceptions of sexual morality that will be my focus, first, the natural lawyer's conception, and second, what I will call the sexual libertarian's conception, have determined the poles of our contemporary debates over the morality and legality, not just of sex itself, but also of both birth control and abortion, but that for various reasons, they have done so implicitly and indirectly rather than explicitly. I think that muting is unfortunate. Each, each of these conceptions of heterosexual morality constitute ways of being sexual, but also ways of being in the world that have very real consequences, some of which are negative, for the many women and men whose lives they partly prescribe. 
We need to make the contours of these conceptions explicit in part so as to better criticize them and in part so as to change them. In these comments, I will present only the heart of that larger project. I want to argue here that both of these conceptions of heterosexuality are badly flawed for a reason that they ironically share to wit, both the natural lawyer and the sexual libertarian put forth a conception of heterosexual morality, of when heterosexual sex is moral, what it must be in order for it to be moral, that is unhinged from women's desires, either for the sex itself or for the pregnancy that often results. Each conditions sexuality differently, but neither conditions the morality of sex on the presence of a woman's desire for it. That sex is wanted by both parties rather than just by one of the parties is not a condition of its morality, either for the natural lawyer or for the sexual libertarian. Yet, I want to argue, unwanted sex causes real harms. More specifically, it causes what I refer to as a set of political harms, which I will briefly describe for the women who engage in such sex and whose sexuality and sexual being they impact. So in this talk, I want to focus first on delineating these two conceptions. I will show in each case how it fails to recognize mutual wantedness as a condition of morally good sex. I'll quickly spell out the political harms unwanted sex can cause, and then I'll finish by briefly speculating on why those harms are so difficult for so many people to see. And I hope to show along the way the striking similarities of these two understandings of sex, beyond the fact that they each are so willfully inattentive to the relevance of women's desire or lack of desire to the morality of the sex they endorse. So I begin with the natural lawyer's conception. Heterosexual sex for natural lawyers, as expressed in writings dating from Thomas Aquinas through the encyclicals on family and marriage from the 20th century, extending in our own time to the academic writings of John Fennis and Robert George, is moral, basically, if it is marital, by which they mean within a traditional marriage, penile vaginal, penetrative, and non-contraceptive, always open to the possibility of new life. Marital sex, so described, is not only morally justified, it is the very point of marriage. Such sex, and only such sex, expresses the friendship of the marital partners, demonstrates their openness to new life, unites them in one flesh, fulfills their natural and joint reproductive capacity and purpose in a way that neither of them can accomplish singly. Marital sex, on this understanding, provides and defines the moral value and the moral meaning of marriage itself. Through such sex, partners become a unitary whole, express and manifest their spiritual friendship, and create new life. Marital sex, and only marital sex, is for this reason non-instrumental. It's engaged in for no other reason than to express that which defines it, spiritual friendness, et cetera, friendship, etc. All other sex, whether engaged in for money, for non-spiritual friendship, for pleasure, for exercise, for affection, even in the hopes of conceiving, all of that is an instrumental use of the body, a splitting of the body from the mind and a subordination of the body to the mind's purposes, and for that reason is sinful. In brief, then, moral heterosexual sex must be marital. Marital sex is moral sex, non-marital sex is immoral. Now, of course, that natural law understanding of the moral conditions of sex, that it be marital, defined as between parties traditionally married, penile, vaginal, penetrative, and non-contraceptive, has attracted an avalanche of criticism, particularly over the last half century. That criticism is focused overwhelmingly on what I call the natural lawyer's sensorial claim. The claim, that is, that the moral condition they identify, that sex be marital, is a necessary condition of good sex. Any sex that is not marital is therefore immoral, subject to censure. Sex for pleasure, sex between non-married heterosexual, sex between all same-sex partners, whether they're civilly married or not, as well as sex between married partners that is contracepted or non-penile vaginal or non that is immoral, as is instrumental sex, whether inside or outside of marriage, sex for pleasure, for profit, for exercise, for affection. Critics of all of that have argued correctly, in my view, that this censures a huge swath of sexual behavior that is in fact morally salutary or simply unobjectionable, including notably all same-sex sex, all sex between either opposite or se same-sex partners outside of traditional marriage that is affectionate, and all sex within marriage that is contraceptive, so as to minimize the risk of conception. What has gone largely unnoticed by critics, however, is what I call the natural lawyer's valorizing claim, by which I mean the sex they endorse rather than the sex they censure. The sensorial claim has garnered so much critical attention that the laudatory claim that so long as sex is marital, it's therefore good, has gone virtually unchallenged. The past is unwarranted. The valorizing claim is at least as problematic as the sensorial. So what sex does the natural lawyer's conception of sexual morality valorize? What is included in their embrace of marital sex as morally exemplary? Does it include, for example, non-consensual marital sex? Does it include rape, so long as the rape is within marriage? It is noteworthy, I'm going to leave the question open, but it is noteworthy that in the many recitations of the various conditions that must be met for sex to be marital, 
and therefore moral for the natural lawyer, that it be within marriage, vaginal, penile, penetrative, all that. Almost never is it also mentioned that the sex has to be consensual. And of course, for centuries, rape within marriage was not regarded as a crime. Aquinas thought it was a sin for a woman to withhold sex from her husband, not for her husband to require it of his wife. Now, attitudes on marital rape may be changing within the church, may be changing among natural lawyers, I think they are. Nevertheless, what is clear and relatively unchanged through the decades is that the marital sex that natural lawyers valorize need not be wanted by either party for it to be morally good. George and Bradley, in their 1996 article on the subject in the Georgetown Law Journal, go so far as to say that marital sex that is unwanted by both parties might nevertheless be morally obligatory. If this is right, if marital sex need not be wanted by either party for it to be morally salutary, then surely the much more common phenomenon of marital sex that is wanted by one party, perhaps the husband, but not by the other, perhaps the wife, is also morally, morally laudatory and perhaps obligatory as well. In other words, marital sex wanted by the husband but not the wife is for the natural lawyer fully moral sex. The absence of mutual desire does not make it any less so. Wantedness is not a moral condition for marital sex. Rather, that sex is marital, again, is a completely sufficient condition for its morality. Third, the marital sex that the natural lawyer lauds clearly includes that sex, whether it's wanted or not, that leads to unwanted pregnancies. That a pregnancy is wanted is not a condition of the morality of the sex that produces it. Every pregnancy, like every birth to which it leads, should be celebrated. Although a couple may reduce the likelihood of an unwanted pregnancy through regulating the timing of intercourse, they may not artificially reduce the risk to near zero. They must be open to the chance of new life with every sexual act in which they engage. That sex risks a pregnancy that might be injurious to health, to the family's finances, to the already existing children, to the mother's education or employment, or simply to her quality of life, or for any other reason may not be wanted, does not affect the morality of the sex that causes it. Her desire not to be pregnant does not render the marital sex that might make her so any less moral. Again, the sex, that sex is marital is a fully, fully sufficient condition of its moral value. Neither the uncontraceptive sex nor the pregnancy to which that sex leads need to be wanted for either or both to be fully moral. For the natural lawyer, the sex is marital is a necessary condition of morality, but also it's sufficient. Marriage is enough. It's all one needs to guarantee the moral value of the sex that meets the, perimeter, the parameters. Now, let me turn to sexual libertarianism. Libertarian, autonomy is the overriding value, just as for the natural lawyer, it's marriage that's the overriding value. Functionally, sex is moral for the sexual libertarian if it is consensual, just as for the natural lawyer, sex is moral if it is marital. The sexual libertarian's conception of sexual morality is like the natural lawyer's in this further functional way. It too consists of both a sensorial claim and a valorizing claim. The sensorial claim of the sexual libertarian is that any sex that is not consensual is therefore immoral. Sex that is not consensual is immoral, whether it's inside or outside marriage, no, for the natural lawyer, sex that is outside marriage is immoral, whether or not it's consensual. Sex that is non-consensual for the libertarian may or may not be rape. It depends on how the state defines rape, but it's always wrong. Sex procured by fraud that vitiates consent is immoral. Sex procured through force or the threat of force is immoral. Sex procured through the coercive of withholding of a deserved grade or promotion is immoral. Sex procured through violence or the threat of it is immoral, whether inside or outside of marriage. And just as the natural lawyer's sensorial claim has attracted waves of criticism, so has the libertarian sensorial claim. Sexual conservatives for several centuries have argued that the prohibition on non-consensual marital sex is misguided and that outside marriage, more than lack of consent, such as signs of resistance or force, should be required for sex to be criminal. More recently, queer theorists have questioned the fetishistic requirement of consent on the grounds that the consent requirement chills valuable and vigorous and life-affirming, albeit somewhat Nietzschean, sex and sexual expression, while others worry that if applied too literally, it runs the risk of criminalizing some conduct, such as sex procured by fraud, which, while perhaps morally questionable, is not necessarily so wrong as to be criminal. And liberals and libertarians debate where the line between consent and non-consent should be drawn and when, and when non-consensual sex should be understood as criminal. The sexual libertarian's sensorial claim, in other words, has provided grist for endless debate, both within the boundaries of liberal and sexual libertarianism, but also between sexual libertarian, li libertarianism and its critics. 
However, the sexual libertarian's valorizing claim that consent is a sufficient condition for the morality of sex, by contrast, has not attracted nearly as much critical attention, either within sexual libertarianism per se or by outside critics. Again, as was true of the natural lawyer's valorizing claim, the pass is unwarranted. Consent is not a sufficient condition for the morality of sex, any more than is marriage. Consensual sex can be fully consensual and yet unwanted. A girl or a woman may consent to sex she does not want for any number of reasons. She may consent because she does it because of peer pressure to ward off a boyfriend or a husband's foul mood, to ensure that a husband or a father will leave enough money for the kids' school lunches the next day, to forestall real or threatened violence should she not consent, to ensure that she receives a deserved or an undeserved high grade in a class or a promotion or pay raise on a job because her material security depends on it, because she believes her religion demands it of her, or that it is her obligation as a wife to do so, or that her community expects it of her, or that the sex is inevitable if her boyfriend is aroused, or that it is the price she has to pay to retain a boy's affection. In none of those cases has she been raped. In all of the cases, she's consented. But in all, she has consented to something she does not want. And that consensual but unwanted sex, like marital but unwanted sex, I think can be harmful. When consensual but unwanted sex, the unwanted intrusion of her body uh, by a penis, is then followed by a consensual unwanted pregnancy, the occupation of her body by a fetus, fetus, that harm is magnified. So what is the harm of unwanted sex, including both marital unwanted sex and consensual unwanted sex? A growing body of empirical research is detailing the harms to women and to some men's psychological well-being consequent to unwanted but consensual sex. I believe, however, there are further harms, not yet really fully explored in the empirical literature, which are as much political as they are psychological. The routine sufferance of unwanted sex, I believe, can compromise a woman or a girl's distinctively liberal sense of selfhood and thereby inhibit her ability to navigate in a liberal world that solidly assumes a liberal conception of self. Thus, first, a woman's physical integrity is shattered. Her body is not the demarcation of the boundary between self and other that is central to liberal conceptions of the self when she consents against her desire to its intrusion by another, whether the other is a penis or fetal life. Second, a woman's sovereignty, her sense of sovereignty over her own body, certainly another hallmark of a liberal self, is compromised when she consents to either sex she does not want or a pregnancy she does not want. When she engages in either, she gives her body over so as to be employed for the use of another and by another, rather than in furtherance of her own projects. Third, her autonomy is obviously compromised. Unwanted sex and unwanted pregnancies limit her freedom of movement in obvious ways. And finally, her integrity is compromised when she follows all this up with untruthful representations both to herself and to her partner about how much she enjoyed the whole thing. So all of that collectively, the compromise of sovereignty, physical integrity, autonomy, um, and uh, moral integrity, undermine the unity of self central to liberalism, a self that forms preferences on the basis of desires and then forms choices on the basis of those preferences and then takes actions on the basis of those choices. The woman or the girl who habitually consents to unwanted sex and then sometimes to unwanted pregnancy by contrast acts in the world in a way that reflects and is deeply rooted in the sexual desires, preferences, and sexual choices of others. Now, of course, a woman or a man who engages in hotly desired sex, a woman who undergoes a fiercely desired pregnancy, also is performing a mode of selfhood that is at odds with liberal presuppositions. A pregnant woman's selfhood and a partner's boundaries and sex are fused with the needs and interests and passions and desires of another in profoundly non and illiberal ways. In fact, just that fusion, I think, is a poignant and persistent, vitally important reminder of the fallacy and the partiality of liberalism itself. When pregnancy or sex is wanted, the experience of pregnancy and the experience of sex are both important counterexamples to the overdrawn atomism of liberal individualism. When they are not wanted, though, that fusion, that blurring of self, the loss of boundary, the forswearance of physical and moral integrity, the immersion of oneself in the interests and needs and ends of the other, is not poignant in the slightest. It is rather, um, to quote Mark Kelman's description of a quite different ph phenomenon, it's just an effing oppression. Desire, you see, makes all the difference. So quickly and in conclusion, just a word on why these harms are hard to discern, articulate, appreciate, and rectify within contemporary legal culture. I am sure the major reason that they are, that they are um, is that they are sustained in the course of fully consensual activities. Unwanted consensual sex is unwanted, but it is consensual, it is not rape. In a world in which consensual activities are widely by definition, productive of value, it's hard to identify any consensual state of affairs as harmful in a world in which sex is so widely and popularly valorized, harms that attend to consensual sex are all the harder to see. 
Unwanted pregnancies, likewise, for the most part, are not coerced. They result from the reckless failure to use birth control or a moral opposition to birth control, then coupled by a fully conscious, consensual assumption of the risk of pregnancy that results, not always, but often. Again, in a world in which consent, including consensual assumptions of risk, implies value, sex is valorized, birth control is available, abortion for the most part legal, the harms that attend an unwanted pregnancy, the risk of which was consensually assumed, disappear into definitional oblivion. Lastly, these harms are not noticed, I believe, because of heterosexual politics, pure and simple. It simply serves the interest of sexually powerful people, many men, some women, to not notice the harms occasioned by unwanted sex and unwanted pregnancies. Women's bodies have been uniquely seen, understood, and used as porous and available as there to serve the interests of others, sexually penetrable and then occupied by new life for millennia, with or without women's consent, whether or not the penetration and occupation has been desired and whether or not it's in women's interest. Only very recently has the radical discontinuity of that understanding of women's bodies with the basic precepts of liberal thought become vivid, and only very recently have we succeeded as a consequence in establishing a woman's consent as a legal and moral condition of that penetration and occupation. Clearly a hard fought but world changing liberal and liberal feminist victory. But consent does not imply desire or interest. We consent to situations in sex and in life we do not desire and which are not in our interest. Heterosexual sex is moral, I believe, not only if both parties consent to it, but also only if both parties want it, only if it is mutually desired that the two prominent conceptions of heterosexual morality, one lauding the morality of marital sex, the other lauding the morality of consensual sex, do not reflect that simple moral imperative, is not terribly surprising. It is, however, unjust, and that injustice does contribute substantially to what John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor, quite wisely and quite correctly, 150 years ago, declared to be the subjugation of women. Thank you. I think at the end of the panel. That was Robin West, uh, Frederick J. Haas Professor of Law and Philosophy at Georgetown Law Center. And Robin, I want to thank you for um, stepping up, and I want to apologize to Alyssa Wolf. We actually started tw about 20 minutes early, and we didn't warn Alyssa <laughs> that we were going to do that. So uh, the fact, so it's our responsibility that uh, we started without you, and, and my apologies, Alyssa. Um, we've decided, though, uh, to go in a different order as a result, <laughs> not just with Robin going first, uh, but because of uh, something uh, internal to the logic of each of the, the talks that we have today. Uh, we are now going to turn to uh, Deborah Denner, who is Associate Professor at uh, Washington University School of Law. So I'm titling my remarks today, Is Anti-Stereotyping Neoliberal? I will use the history of feminist activism challenging pregnancy as well as the history of counter-mobilization by employers to ask some questions about the Supreme Court's recent March 2015 decision in Young versus United Parcel Service interpreting the Pregnancy Discrimination <coughs> Act of 1978 or the PDA. So this case highlighted the question about whether our approach to promoting the labor force participation of pregnant women um, is best to achieve through an anti-stereotyping model or a social welfare model. And I'd like to suggest that the anti-stereotyping model, which forms the linchpin of the court's interpretation of the PDA, advances a neoliberal agenda. By contrast, the social welfare model holds the best hope for promoting substantive gender and class equality. So let me begin by defining what I mean by the anti-stereotyping model and the social welfare model before the details of the history in the young case. An anti-stereotyping theory of sex equality under law just stands for the proposition that laws should not reinforce sex role stereotypes. Thus, legislation should not be based on the notion that the ideal family is comprised of a male breadwinner and a dependent female caregiver and children the anti-stereotyping model successfully challenges the way in which law entrenches traditional gender roles. 
but it fails to challenge two core components of neoliberalism, one, the allocation of economic responsibility for reproduction to the private family, and two, the valorization of the idea of the rational free market. So the anti-stereotyping model does not advance the idea that the whole society benefits from reproduction and thus should assume public responsibility for reproduction's costs. And it only requires that employers refrain from market irrational discrimination. So this is instances in which an employer takes account of traits that are actually irrelevant to the economic functioning of that individual. So for example, an example of uh, market irrational discrimination would be when an employer behaves irrationally when he fires a pregnant woman because he <coughs> believes that she's no longer capable of performing her job when in fact the opposite is true. So under this prohibition, though, an employer could still discriminate on the basis of pregnancy when pregnancy in actuality still affects an employee's capacity to perform her job duties. So by contrast, the social welfare model suggests that the costs of reproduction are a public responsibility. It also suggests that employers have duties to end market rational discrimination. So this may impose a mandate on employers to employ an individual even when doing so costs that employer more than employing other individuals. So for example, interpreting pregnancy discrimination law to require employers to extend workplace accommodations to pregnant workers increases those employers' personnel costs. So I want to acknowledge that the social welfare model is not inherently in tension with an anti-stereotyping model. So one it could, at least in theory, have universal social welfare entitlements that also destabilize traditional gender roles. So an an example would be paid fam family leave as a form of social insurance that contains incentives for men as well as women to utilize the leave. As a matter of history, however, because of external political and legal constraints, um, feminist advocates have often been forced to choose between the social welfare and the anti-stereotyping models. So in the remainder of my time, I'll explain some of this interaction between the anti-stereotyping and social welfare models as they apply to pregnant workers. And I'll analyze just really briefly three historical moments, feminist advocacy in the early 1970s, the business response to that feminist advocacy prior to the enactment of the PDA, and employer and feminist activism in the decade following the PDA. So in conclusion, I'll reflect on how this history may help illuminate some of the strengths and weaknesses of the court's decision in Young. So in the early 1970s, women's rights advocates stopped advocating a social welfare model of pregnancy and began advocating for an anti-stereotyping model. So to go back to the longer history, in the post-World War II period through the 1950s, feminist advocates in the labor movement had argued for the creation of a social insurance system that would offer paid maternity leave. In 1966, the newly created National Organization for Women echoed this ideal when they passed in favor of, quote, paid maternity leave as a form of social security for all working mothers. And similarly, in the late 1960s, the Citizens Advisory Council on the Status of Women, which was first established by President Kennedy, argued for, quote, special recognition of the absence due pr to pregnancy in the form of maternity leaves from work. But by 1967, now had retreated from its social welfare model. Similarly, in 1970, the Citizens Advisory Council issued a report that rejected its earlier position. And instead, the Advisory Council's report stated that pregnant women should be treated the same as other temporarily disabled workers. So what explains this shift from the social welfare to the anti-stereotyping model? The passage of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the imperative to combat employer bias prompted this shift. So circa 1970, employers still routinely fired pregnant women or they required them to take mandatory, so-called mandatory unpaid maternity leaves without any form of job security. Um, so the temporary disability mo model or analogy required that employers treat pregnant women as individuals rather than as a group. Employers would no longer be able to classify pregnant women based on stereotype assumptions about their abilities and, and social commitments, but would have to evaluate pregnant women's individual capacities to do their jobs. In addition, the temporary disability model combated sex role stereotypes by embracing an emerging feminist distinction between biological sex and the social construction of gender. 
So by distinguishing between childbearing and early infant care, the temporary disability model challenged the social norm that new mothers should leave the workforce to care for their children. And feminists at the time hoped that sex neutrality under law would disrupt the gender division of labor within the family, making more social space for men to take uh, increased responsibility for child rearing. Although the temporary disability model re represented an embrace of the anti-stereotyping model, it also serves social welfare goals. So an analogizing pregnancy to a temporary disability would give childbearing workers greater access to insurance coverage, to paid leave from work, to disability benefits that would help replace a lost income during time away from the workplace. And in this way, the anti-discrimination model could help shift some of the costs of reproduction from the private family to the larger society. But this new anti-stereotyping model came with disadvantages. So it failed to provide an affirmative grant to, child, uh, to childbearing leave or health insurance coverage uh, for pregnancy. Instead, it required only same treatment. So by giving up the aspiration to a social insurance system of maternity maternity leaves, this new anti-stereotyping, anti-discrimination model left the most vulnerable workers, low-income and contingent workers, whose employers only offered very meager fringe benefits without access to pr protections for pregnancy. So prior to the enactment, well, in sum, let me just say that there was this shift from a social welfare to an anti-discrimination model, but incorporated within that anti-stereotyping goals was some still adherence to using anti-discrimination as kind of a bootstrap to economic security. Um, but prior to the enactment of the PDA, and then again following its passage, employers consistently appropriated this anti-stereotyping idea, idea and tried to sever it from feminist redistributive goals. So let me explain what I mean by that. In the early 1970s, employers argued that pregnancy status as a private choice meant it should remain a private economic responsibility. So in this way, the business lobby fused free market economic principles with the concept of reproductive privacy. So specifically, business groups argued that the legalization of birth control and abortion had rendered pregnancy truly voluntary. Accordingly, pregnancy should not be classified as a temporary disability because it was voluntary. And likewise, motherhood, because motherhood no longer defined women's roles or social identity, these employers argued, the courts should not recognize pregnancy discrimination as sex discrimination. So in enacting the PDA as an amendment to Title VII, Congress rejected these arguments by employers. And the first clause of the PDA defines sex discrimination under Title VII to include pregnancy discrimination or discrimination on the basis of childbirth and related medical conditions. And the second clause of the PDA states that, quote, women affected by pregnancy shall be treated the same as other persons not so affected but similar in their ability or inability to work. So the PDA quite clearly embraced an anti-stereotyping model, but the legislative history left much more ambiguous the redistributive dimensions of the statute. So certainly when an employer had a fringe benefit plan that assumed some of the costs of temporary illness via health insurance or disability benefits, it had to do the same with respect to pregnancy. But to what extent would the PDA require employers to change the fundamental terms of the workplace and its organization in order to accommodate pregnant workers? So scattered comments in the legislative history that said that the PDA uh, wouldn't require that much of employers. It would only require same treatment and not require employers to create any disability <coughs> benefits not already offered. But as scholars um, argued at the time, the PDA was also amending Title VII, uh, which recognizes disparate impact liability. So I won't get into this now, um, but disparate impact, some of the debate about the redistributive dimensions of the PDA centered on this question of disparate impact liability prongs, the prong of the PDA. And the take home point here is that courts reluctance to recognize these kinds of suits, in fact, and not just in theory, showed their reluctance to interpret the PDA as a redistributive statute. So after the passage of the PDA, employers used its anti-stereotyping dimensions to undercut its redistributive ones. So specifically, employers brought cases challenging state laws that required employers to provide job secure leave to pregnant workers. So businesses argued that because the state laws did not do the same for other temporarily disabled but non-pregnant workers, that these laws actually violated the PDA and Title VII. 
So these cases were actually part of a broader strategy to use Title VII as a deregulatory law um, or tool, <coughs> meaning that employers were routinely in the race and sex context using an anti-discrimination man mandate to try and undercut labor protections generally. And I won't address this now, but I can go into it more if you're interested during breaks or during Q&A. So in the mid-1980s, one of the cases challenging this state pregnancy leave law, CalFed v. Guerra, wound its way up to the US Supreme Court. Um, and the argument here, uh, as I said, was that uh, these pregnancy leave laws violated the PDA. And the case split feminists between their anti-stereotyping and their redistributive <laughs> commitment. So this is an example of the way in which an external um, anti-feminist advocate divided feminist commitments. Um, since CalFed, much of employer resistance to the PDA has concerned whether the statute mandates that employers extend light duty policy provided for some groups of workers to pregnant workers. And this is where the Young v. UPS case comes in. Um, in Young, the U.S. Supreme Court has responded with a resounding, it depends. So what the answer depends on is whether the employer inappropriately uh, um, employed stereotypes, on the basis of pregnancy or exhibited animus towards pregnant work. You probably know the facts from media reports about the case. UPS required pregnant to stop working when her doctor and midwife recommended that she lift no more than 20 pounds. But UPS provided light duty accommodations to three classes of workers, those with a workplace injury, those defined as disabled under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and those who had lost their Department of Transportation certifications. But US, UPS did not provide light duty to any workers, including pregnant workers, not within those three categories. And later, as a result of the litigation, they changed their policy, but that didn't enter the case. So the doctrinal question in the case centered on the relationship between the first and second clauses of the PDA. And the plaintiffs and Young argued that the plain language of the statute, the same treatment language in the second clause, required the accommodation of pregnant workers in the same manner as UPS accommodated workers falling within one of the above three enumerated, enumerated categories. By contrast, UPS argued that the second clause of the PDA had no substantive content but was just adding to the definition in the first clause. Um, and that the light duty policy uh, did not discriminate against pregnant workers, but rather was pregnancy blind because it didn't target pregnant workers specifically, but excluded them w according to a characteristic that was not, uh, not directly related to pregnancy. So the district court in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in favor of UPS. Happily, the Supreme Court vacated the Fourth Circuit opinion and remanded the case. Um, but what I want to suggest is that Young is not as much of a win as it seems on first glance. So the court's majority steered a middle ground between the arguments of the plaintiffs and defendants. It rejected both and said instead that the Young opinion requires the lower courts to evaluate the exclusion of pregnancy from light duty accommodations according to the McDonnell Douglas burden shifting framework analyzing disparate treatment under Title VII. So the problem is, is that the inquiry is still restricted to one of animus and stereotyping. So if an employer has decided to exclude pregnancy from light du duty accommodations based on beliefs that pregnant women are, for example, disloyal employees or on the basis of similar stereotypes, the employer will be held liable. But if the employer can prove a legitimate non-discriminatory rationale that's not pretextual, then it's going to escape liability. Um, so the court did uh, poke a whole lot of holes in what constitutes a legitimate non-discriminatory rationale. Um, they said that uh, plaintiffs can prove pretext by showing that the burden on women um, kind of overrides uh, the cost-based rationales provided by employers. Um, and they showed the ways in which statistics could create a, general, a genuine issue of material fact around that burden. Um, but my fear is that many cases into this latter category of a uh, legitimate non-discriminatory rationale. So I don't see much hope um, to think that courts today, less so than in the past, will be eager to see the PDA as a statute that requires redistribution of the cost of reproduction. Nor does Young address the problem of vulnerable employees in the workplace, in workplaces which don't offer light duty accommodations in the first instance. So these women still face a Hobson's choice between childbearing and economic security. 
security. So in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that it might be time to recognize the limitations of the anti-stereotyping model and return to a social welfare model. Um, and the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which would require reasonable accommodations for pregnant women that don't impose an undue hardship on the employers, would be one place to start. And 13 states have already state versions of this act, so there's room for advocacy both on the state and the legi federal legislative levels. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Jennifer Hendricks, Associate Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Juvenile and Family Law Program at Colorado, excuse me, Colorado Law uh, at University of Colorado uh, Boulder. It's the Colorado Law School, right, at, at Boulder. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about a paper that I am working on called Genetic Essentialism in Family Law. So the rhetoric of reproduction with which I'm concerned is something that I'm referring to as genetic essentialism. So I'm going to start by explaining what I mean by that. I mean something different than what we often think of as genetic determinism or the belief that your genes sort of predestine various things about who you are in your life. What I mean by genetic essentialism is a view that takes uh, your genetic makeup and in particular genetic inheritance from parents uh, to be essential to identity and to family identity. So that the, the essence of what it means to be the parent of a child is to be a genetic contributor to that child as opposed to other models of parenting based on gestation, um, caretaking, that sort of thing. Um, so, so by genetic essentialism, I mean um, this commitment to a definition of parenthood that is strongly based on genetics, that that's what makes someone a parent. And I want to talk today about some of the effects that I see in the law of taking that particular view of parenthood. One of them that may be familiar to people uh, is that this a commitment to a genetic definition of parenthood is a first step toward uh, a sort of um, life begins at conception, the fetus is a distinct individual entity from the pregnant woman uh, that Riva Siegel talked about extensively in Reasoning from the Body. This idea that once the sperm and egg come together, that's a new identity, it's essentially self-executing, it's just kind of hanging out inside the pregnant woman. Uh, but it is a self-executing being that is really just unfolding into its already predetermined self. Uh, and this is a view of reproduction that um, goes back fairly far historically in terms of uh, seeing uh, a pregnant woman as, you know, the fertile field in which the seed planted by the father uh, unfolds. Uh, it took a lot of sort of scientific, eff scientific effort to even convince male scientists that contrary to all evidence, men weren't the primary contributors to the creation of children. Uh, so genetic essentialism is sort of a fallback of that sort of patriarchal view that the woman is just the fertile field. Uh, it's a sort of grudging acknowledgement of, well, okay, the mother's contribution is equal because they both contribute genes. Uh, so, spoiler, I don't like this. <laughs> right. So, I think this is a male supremacist theory of reproduction and parenthood. Uh, it has harmful effects with regard to how we think of abortion. Uh, it has, uh, in my view, bad out results in bad outcomes in cases involving reproductive technology where it has a sort of neoliberal twist in what's important is less whether the genes came from your body than whether you own them. So you own them if they came from your body or you bought them from the person that, whose body they came from. Uh, so it has unfortunate results in that area as well. Uh, but um, the, the, the things I want to focus on today are the um, 
post-birth conceptions of parenthood uh, in terms of how we define a legally protectable parent-child relationship. And my, my particular concern in this paper has been to think about some areas of the law in which in recent years feminist legal scholars have um, embraced what I see as a genetic essentialist approach to parenthood for various reasons in the cause of sex equality, uh, but in ways that I think are counterproductive. So I want to suggest that an embrace of genetic essentialism as a short-term strategy is not wise um, because it is it's ultimately not the right approach. Um, so I have um, four examples that I may or may not talk about all of them right now, uh, in which um, it's some uh, feminist family law scholars have embraced um, a genetic essential, essentialist approach to parenthood. And a lot of this arises out uh, or is related to some old Supreme Court cases that I want to mention briefly for those who um, might not be familiar with them, uh, which uh, are known as sort of the unwed father cases. It was a series of cases in the 1970s in which the Supreme Court actually put forth a different definition of parenthood um, and specifically sort of rejected the idea that genetics are sort of the essence and the be all end all of, of parenthood uh, and came up with what's known as a biology plus relationship test for the purpose of deciding when unmarried fathers had certain rights, to certain parental rights to their children. Uh, and the idea was that the genetic connection alone wasn't enough. Just the fact that you were the genetic father doesn't mean that you have full-blown constitutional rights um, to be deemed a parent of the child. It has to be the biological connection plus some kind of caretaking relationship. And this test for men was fairly explicitly um, based on an, an assumption that a gestational mother, a birth mother, is the sort of archetypal holder of constitutional parental rights because she is a biological parent by virtue of both genes and gestation. And gestation was seen as a sort of, as a physical caretaking, you've worked, you've done stuff, uh, and have a specific relationship with the child that goes beyond genetics. Uh, and uh, men aren't able to, generally, to fulfill that in the same way, but if they similarly um, establish a caretaking relationship, then their rights become equal to the rights of a gestational mother. Uh, so th that's a different vision of parenthood that still is based in biology, including genetic biology, uh, but has some other components as well. Um, there are a couple of problems, probably many, but two I'm going to mention, with how those cases have played out in family law on the ground in terms of adjudication of parental rights um, for for unwed fathers in particular. One is, in my view, this is bad, that, that the, those cases are, are used um, really only for the purpose of cutting off unwed fathers' rights to consent to adoption of their child. Um, several, not all, of the original Supreme Court cases were in that context, usually where the mother was seeking to have the child adopted by a new partner. Uh, but in more recent times, uh, the, the, the idea that the, that the father needs to have this relationship with the child before he has full-blown parental rights uh, is used primarily to sort of cut fathers out of third-party adoption processes. Father has placed the child for adoption uh, and um, and, and there's, the question arises, do we need to even try to find the dad? And in many states, there's not much effort to do so. The second major problem has been that although the Supreme Court cases described the, re the necessary relationship that a father needed to establish to have parental rights in fairly, I would say, caretaking-oriented terms, in terms of providing sort of day-to-day -day loving care for the child, uh, in state legislatures and state courts, that has become equated to paying child support. Uh, so fathers are regarded as, you know, sources of financial support. If they are unable to provide that financial support, they are essentially disregarded, discounted, uh, and to the extent that they have provided other caretaking support, that's generally ignored. I mean, 
broad statements, but is, is, is often ignored and is not seen as fulfilling fatherhood. Uh, because fatherhood is about providing financial support. And feminists have been rightly concerned about this construction of masculinity, of fatherhood, um, and the ways in which it is um, used, again, in kind of a neoliberal fashion to provide sort of expanded rights to fathers with financial means and diminished rights for low-income men, uh, in which the, sort of these rules are often used against um, the interest of, of low-income fathers who want to be involved in their child's lives, uh, and it's as well as against the interests of, of low-income women. So, so, so feminists have two concerns with this in the adoption context, I think. One is, the, um, is that sort of constrained financial definition of fatherhood, where the father's rights turn not on you know, whether he's taking care of the baby, but whether he paid for prenatal visits or something. Uh, and the other is that there's, uh, there's uh, one of the reasons why feminist advocates have sometimes embraced um, uh, some, a, a strong claim for the rights of genetic fathers is that um, the, the Cut, cutting off of, of unwed fathers' rights is not the only way that we have a really strong pro-adoption pol policy in place in a lot of aspects of the legal system. So the United States um, has, you know, on the one hand, very few supports compared to a lot of other countries for low-income mothers, uh, and a very um, aggressive adoption system that, that puts a lot of pressure on uh, women to consent to adoption uh, and to give irrevocable consent much earlier than a lot of other countries do uh, in terms of how long after the birth the consent to adoption can become irrevocable. So if you've heard of, sort of some of the high profile cases that have been in the news at various times of, of cases in which the mother placed a child for adoption and this poor upper middle class adoptive family is now being confronted with the claims of a genetic father who's trying to give the child back. In a lot of those cases, what has happened is that the mother has regretted the placement for adoption, often very promptly, uh, but has no legal recourse because her consent has become irrevocable so quickly. Uh, and the only sort of available route is to get the father to come and try to assert rights and say there was a procedural defect in cutting off his rights in the first place. Uh, so that's um, w one of the um, scenarios in which um, feminists have been inclined to sort of use a strong genetic um, definition of fatherhood and to support those kinds of claims. Um, and I, I, on those, I, I, my, my feeling is that we need to address those problems more directly. Right? We need to deal with some of the problems in the adoption system. We need to deal with the construction of fatherhood financial transaction, uh, and that this um, is not a, a, claims of genetic entitlement are not a productive way ultimately of reaching those goals. Um, there's a second and related reason um, that feminists have sometimes supported a sort of genetic definition of parenthood um, is um, is what I think of as the, the stalled revolution theory of giving men parental rights. So the stalled revolution is this idea that, okay, women moved into the workplace uh, and we have pretty good equality law there, but um, things are still unequal at home and women are disproportionately bearing um, responsibilities for um, rearing children uh, and men aren't stepping up enough to be involved in nurturing children and maybe if we give them parental rights uh, we that they'll that will encourage men to nurture. If we say, you know, just the fact that father means that you have these rights, and therefore you'll be more involved in nurturing children. Uh, and I have a couple of concerns about that. One is that we've tried that in divorce law, uh, and it didn't work out very well for women, uh, because what it does is give the divorcing husband a bargaining chip uh, when you say that as a matter of the formal law, the parents are equal, and we just as soon give custody to either one of them, whereas on the ground, disproportionate impact, right, for the vast majority of people, the, the wife is much more in 
invested in the children and the idea of losing them is much more of a threat to her uh, that greatly diminishes her ability to think to seek fair financial settlements and that sort of thing in the divorce uh, so I, I think of it as it's the unilateral disarmament <laughs> approach to gender wars and I don't support that uh, so the other um, the other thing I'll just say about that is uh, the, I, the, Despite that, I, 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 do, I, I, I do understand a sort of desire to try to expand parenthood in order to bring men into it more. And I would just say, let's, let, my, my objection would be um, that, and we're going to say, OK, let's you know, adopt this definition of parenthood that's very male-oriented, that's like designed to give men more rights. Uh, let's at least be explicit about what we're doing and not claim that this is about, like, e about equality um, and not adopt a sort of very shallow definition of parenthood that says that, um, that, that well, it, you know, if, in order for mothers and fathers to be equal, we have to give them both rights, uh, as if um, we, we there so for, thereby said, well, we're just going to define parenthood as whatever men contribute to parenthood and leave out um, the parts that a gestational mother contributes. Uh, so, so let's not claim that we're doing this for the sake of an equal defini definition of parenthood. Let's be explicit about we're doing it to try to achieve sort of certain um, other social goals. Um, I have one other I think I want to talk about. So the, the third one I'll just mention is that there have been of late some proposals um, from a f sort of feminist perspective for policies such as um, adopting rules that all babies must be tested genetically at birth in order to assign parenthood appropriately from the beginning, um, which um, would really um, instantiate this idea of a genetic definition of parenthood at the expense of a lot of other policies that are like things like the marital presumption, where we just assume the husband's the father, uh, which, which we do have reasons for assuming. Uh, but the, the, the fourth one, which I want to have time to talk about a bit, is um, uh, th there's, if, if you watch The Daily Show, there was a segment last week on this proposal called the Rape Survivors Child Custody Act. Uh, which was introduced in Congress last year, um, and perfect, uh, and will probably be, and, and actually is a version of something that is already in place uh, in a lot of states. Uh, and um, the the idea is that in, in the federal version, it would basically give states money if they promise to make sure that um, that rapists' parental rights can be terminated. If a, if a man rapes a woman resulting in a pregnancy and she's keeping the child, that he will not uh, be able to assert parental rights to this, to, to the child. And it, it comes from a couple of quite a few examples of cases where, in fact, that has happened. Uh, the most notorious one being um, a Massachusetts like parole board or probation board that actually ordered the rapist sort of as a condition of his probation to take responsibility for his child by petitioning for establishment of paternity and a visitation order. Uh, so, you know, bringing the victim into court. And that's awful and terrible and so very sympathetic. If you saw the Daily Show segment, it was pretty much like presented as a no-brainer. Um, I do think there are some poorly thought out poorly thought out aspects to this statute. Um, and but I'm sort of more interested in it as um, as it relates to these issues of genetic essentialism. So I have a sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Rape Survivors Child Custody Act. I'm going to go out of order, so I'm going to start with the bad about it. The worst thing about this statute from my perspective is that it actually accepts the premise, right, that in the absence of other action, the rapist is entitled to parental rights solely by virtue of being the genetic father. Uh, and frankly, have that assumption already in place, we wouldn't have a lot of these problems of the cases um, involving the, the rapist doing for custody rights because he wouldn't have a basis for claiming it anyway. So partly that's just my poster child. This is why it's bad to say that genes automatically give you legal rights to a kid. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, the, the ugly is that I do think the statute betrays some, assu some assumptions. Um, it has some assumptions built into it about what rape looks like. Um, it definitely evokes this image of like the stranger who jumped out from behind a bush and raped you, uh, and then you had a kid, but he has no other connection to your life. And so there are two 
problems with that. One is if the rapist is also the husband uh, and, um, and they raise the child together for a few years and then later um, are getting a divorce, it might not be constitutional to terminate his parental rights at that point because we don't routinely terminate the parental rights of someone because they committed a crime against someone other than the child. Um, and in fact, it's, very, it's rather odd if, if you react to that by saying, oh, but God, of course, like if he's a rapist, he shouldn't have parental rights. Why then does the statute depend on the conception having resulted from the rape? If there was consensual sex and there were rapes, uh, why do you have to prove that the pregnancy happened to result from one of the rapes uh, rather than from one of the um, consensual times? Uh, and the other aspect of it is that it, it, it is possible for women to commit rape, uh, and the, the statute is, is sex specific. It terminates only the rights of male rapists. Um, I think it's right to do so, but it doesn't really deal with the complication of that, right? It's right to do so because there's a difference between giving birth to a child and being the genetic parent of a child um, in terms of what we should terminate. Um, the thing I really like about this statute, however, uh, is that it is a rare acknowledgement of the fact that recognizing parental rights based on a purely genetic relationship of the father um, affects the mother. Right? So in the arguments over this statute, the, claim, the, the, the sort of emotions being evoked are not about actually the rapist's fitness as a parent. Nobody actually really focuses that. What they focus on is what a terrible thing that is to do to the victim um, to compromise her parental rights to her child with this person who's committed a crime against her. Um, and it is, um, it is unusual. Uh, to, to see an acknowledgement that when a child has an existing full-blown constitutionally protected parent, uh, that inserting a new parent into that relationship is a diminishment of her existing rights. So courts and legislatures tend to treat the child of a single mother as missing something, right? There is a blank space on the birth certificate that can be filled in without regard to what she thinks about it. Right, like with, over her objection, it doesn't matter because it's a blank space. Uh, and this is an unusual recognition that a child of a single mother has a parent, has a parent with constitutionally protected rights, for those who know the case, has a parental rights, uh, and that to diminish those rights by, rec by sort of legally recognizing um, someone else's parental rights uh, requires an inquiry into the effect that that's having on her and requires some sort of state interest, such as a detriment to the child, uh, if, um, if rights aren't recognized. And that's actually the sort of legal framework that I'm working, thinking about here, is sort of using Troxel as a model to say, if you have a gestational parent who's full-blown recognized constitutional parent and you're wanting to recognize another parent either because you think it's good for the kid or because we think that will improve sex equality because men will take care of kids whatever it is you do actually need to grapple with the fact that you are diminishing existing constitutional rights in order to do that uh, and so it isn't cost less it may be a cost worth paying but it is not cost less and it is certainly not demanded by some sort of shallow genetic theory of equality for parents thank you Our next speaker is finally uh, Alyssa Wolf, <laughs> president and director of programs of uh, the organization uh, called Real Reason. Thank you. So my name is Alyssa, and I'm a linguist at a law med conference. And I feel a little bit like. Hi, Alyssa. <laughs> um, there's still the possibility I'm in the wrong room, but probably not. So I think probably the reason that I'm here is to offer into this discussion, to pepper this discussion today with some thoughts about popular models of reproduction and popular models of abortion and sex and contraception and how popular models, how we deeply understand, deeply below the level of consciousness, how we understand 
what it is to reproduce and what implications that has for what it is to use contraception, to have an abortion, and to have those be in the back of our minds today as we listen to the rest of the panels. What is it that we're actually um, working to overcome if we're working to make changes to policy around those, around those issues? So I'm happy to do that because my work as a cognitive linguist at Real Reason is, is focused on digging into what we can learn from language, from language evidence, language data, about how people are reasoning at a deep level, and again, under the conscious level. So what, what we know about human reasoning is that we have to develop these amazing, these beautiful, these incredibly efficient and um, beneficial shortcuts, mental shortcuts. We have an amount of information and sensory stimulation and experiences that are just coming into us all the time. And as humans, our minds have developed these incredible shortcuts to help us process that. Ignore what we don't need to focus on, focus on what we need to, and day in a, in a broad way. Um, and those come with a lot of baggage. So I'm talking about things like metaphors, conceptual metaphors. I'm talking about things like stereotypes, right? In the way that they function, they're these gorgeous, efficient processes. And in the way that they impact our reasoning, they can really mess us up, <laughs> right? They can help us think that we're focusing where we need to focus and, in fact, be leading us astray, depending on what our goals are. So we study that at Real Reason. We study the way that deep, below the level of consciousness reasoning, embedded reasoning, affects the way that we think about things like abortion, contraception, reproduction. And I keep repeating that it's below the conscious level because that's really the most important thing to keep in mind is that all of us here are capable of sitting and having a discussion where we argue, where we debate, where we consider, well, we could, when we've just done that on the panel today, uh, what does it mean to be a parent? Well, let's talk about it this way. No, we could talk about it this way. We could think of it this way. We can all do that. What we can't do is erase the below the conscious understanding of what it is to have a pregnancy, to be a parent. That's always there with us. It's embedded in our language. And I, I won't go through all the evidence for that right now, though I'm happy to talk a little bit about it in questions and answers or afterwards. Um, and therefore, when we're seeking, especially when we're seeking popular support as advocates, or we're experiencing um, popular pushback against a policy that we think makes a lot of sense, or I'm not an attorney, but I understand some of you are. <laughs> if we're arguing, uh, if we're litigating, if we're in front of a judge who doesn't seem to get what we're trying to say, we're everyone in this room, all the judges, all the juries, all the people in the public, we're all people that have minds that work in this way I'm talking about. And so we don't always realize what models, what understandings, what conceptions of these important uh, concepts are working against our top of mind, conscious, intentional reasoning to make some things seem like they make sense and some don't. So I think what I'll do is just jump right in and it seems to make sense when we're talking about reproduction to talk a little bit about sex, which is um, certainly not the only way, but still the understood, the dominantly understood way to get to reproduction. So when we talk about models of sexuality, apart from, I want to say, apart from forced or otherwise coerced experiences of sex and for reproduction when we're talking about heterosexual reproduction. Um, when we study that, which we did in order to understand some issues around sexuality education policy, you see very quickly that here in the English language in America, and it goes actually goes quite a bit more broad than just here in the US, but that's where we studied it. Quickly, there bubble up to the surface, um, there bubbles up to the surface evidence for two main understandings, models, deep conceptual representations of what sexuality is, metaphors for sexuality and sexual desire. And what are they? Well, 
they tell us that either, on the one hand, a person who experiences sexuality, sexual desire, is a person who's experiencing a struggle with an opponent. That's number one. So we think of things like, um, think of things like struggle with your lust or um, overcome feelings of, oh, I have a really cute slide, but I didn't get it in in time, and it would just make it all very clear up there. There's like a wrestler. and um, One model, though, I'll just stick with the models, is of an opponent. That sexuality is something that is in, understood to be like an outside of us, picture a wrestler, you know, outside of us, somebody who has needs and experiences and goals and intentions that are different from our own, and that when we engage with it, we're a little bit at risk. There's a little bit of a threat there. Something might happen that isn't quite what we intended. That, there is a strong model of sexuality that is of sexuality as an opponent that exists. Another strong model of sexuality and sexual desire is that of it being a contaminant. So that's very clear in things like, in um, pieces of language evidence like dirty thoughts, filthy mind, Sex ed shouldn't be polluting the minds of young people. We get language like pollution, dirty, filthy. Right? Those are just sort of the most obvious, least subtle versions. And we have a model of sexuality in, built into our language and into our minds in this culture that sexuality and sexual desire is like a contaminant, a pollutant. Okay? That shows up in all kinds of ways. And everybody can understand that if people reason that way to them. And everybody can understand the model of sexuality as an opponent. We all have them, and we have other models as well. But those are the two dominant. And the reason that I take a few minutes about them is to say that when we are not front of mind, consciously reasoning and purposely trying to think, well, what is what does the fact that a person had sex have to do with my thoughts about my coming to judgment about this other issue? When we're not doing that so thoughtfully and so intentionally, we are having common sense reactions. We are having gut level responses that can be based in, oh, this person hmm, they must have kind of been weak enough to get, to get involved in that. Or, oh, this person did something kind of gross. You know? And these, we may never, ever form these in language in our minds. We may never think them clearly. We may not be aware that we have these thoughts. Of them. And so when we're talking about, for example, who is a person who would advocate for sex ed in schools? Or, to move to today, who is a person who might need an abortion? What do we know about them? Well, we know they had sex. We think they probably had sex, right? Some of what we know, or we think we know, reality, is imported into our reasoning about the, the group or the class of people that we're considering. Sometimes when we do this, when we understand a concept metaphorically and we import our understanding onto the people it's impacting, it works very well and we come to that are very functional and help us make progress. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't happen that way at all. Sometimes it comes with a lot of baggage that's distracting, problematic, and contributes to stereotypes and stigma. So I want to take a minute to talk about sexuality in general and offer you that opponent and that contaminant model because they're, they're, um, they're pretty vivid. If we understand that people who come, if we understand someone else, not us, because we have a much richer experience of ourselves than we do of an other. But if we consider others who've come into contact with sexuality as someone who has put themselves in a dangerous position and struggled and perhaps been overcome, perhaps, um, again, with themselves, overcome by a part of themselves, not in a forced situation, overcome by another. Or someone who is kind of mucked about in something that's kind of icky. Right? If those are the, the baseline reasoning, if it's against that that we make sort of common sense gut feeling decisions about the people who we are now considering, assessing, deciding whether we want to take the energy and time to support a policy around, um, we're, kind of, we're kind of in trouble. <laughs> right? And I wish that I had 
Um, I wish I had a third dominant popular model of sexuality that I could offer you, um, and I don't. We don't have another dominant. We have other models of sexuality, absolutely. We don't have another dominant popular model of sexuality that shows up in public discourse, that evi where evidence of it shows up in public discourse. Um, so we're kind of in trouble in this country around sexuality-related issues, if you didn't already know that. <laughs> that's the new information you've learned today. Um, but it's important to keep in, it is important to keep in mind that the reason I say it's as particular that it's important to keep in mind, even though we can't necessarily um, just away, is that a lot of people in the organization, and you feel like either I'm crazy or those people are terrible people, or those people don't have any logic, and it's not always that. Sometimes it's that you or they, if it's you who's kind of in your, in your conceptual space, reasoning from models that make it harder for you to reason in the productive way. So just, I don't know if that's a, a, a lift, but people aren't as crazy as you think they are. <laughs> they're somewhat more crazy than they should be, but they're not as crazy <laughs> as you think they are. Is that fair? I don't know. Um, but I also, may I do a time check? I know it's not a scheduled one, but just so I know. Great. Um, I also want to share a few models of pregnancy, since we're particularly here around the rhetoric of reproduction. And these models sound nicer, but they have baggage that comes with them as well that I'll offer. Um, remembering that we cannot control the presence of these models of pregnancy in our minds, though we consciously overcome them in a set of circumstances. Okay, so I'll very quickly I'll very quickly list a set that float to the top of generally accepted popular understandings of what pregnancy is. And again, set unconscious understandings of pregnancy. So, and they can be conscious too, I should say. They're not only unconscious. They can become conscious. So some of these may sound familiar. Um, but one that came up earlier in the panel, I think Jennifer was talking about this idea that um, being pregnant is tending a plant or a crop, right? That there is a soil, a seed, it grows, okay? I'm trying to decide whether to make the list. I'll just make the whole list so that it's tending a crop. Um, that pregnancy is protecting something that is vulnerable. That pregnancy is achieving a goal. That pregnancy is um, using one's body as a machine. These are metaphors, remember. That pregnancy is a balancing competition. That pregnancy is a job, a project, a project type of job that happens over time. Pregnancy is a journey, and that's for both the woman and the fetus, the baby. And that pregnancy is being a gatekeeper. Now, that one's a unique one, so I'm going to set it over here for a second, but I, I'm going to try to remember to come back to it. For the other set, and again, there are other models of pregnancy, but these are the ones that really rose to the top of the set of language data that we studied. Part of our job is to then go and look at the models and say, OK, if these are semi or unconscious understandings of pregnancy, then what are we led to understand about people who are pregnant, people who have an abortion? What are we led to understand? What is the internal logic of these models? What does it tell us? So if I'm growing a crop and I decide to raise my fields when the crop is sort of half up, is there a way in which in, within agriculture that makes sense? There might be. I mean, maybe there's pests or something like that, right? But in general, if I say, oh, look, here's a hoe. I'm going to chop up my plants. That, where's the logic, right? Does that make any sense? And I, what I'm saying is that for real, when we are operating with an unconscious understanding of pregnancy as agriculture, in a way, raising plants as using soil to grow plants, an abortion actually at that same under the control, rising and confusing and active and kind of crazy seeming, as it might be if you heard that a farmer just went out one day and started hacking up their, their crops. OK? 
Okay. Is that okay? No. But does it happen? Yes. Is it a natural kind of a common sense understanding of what abortion might be? It's there. If you are protecting something, right, if pregnancy is the protection of something that's more vulnerable, and that's a little bit, a little bit literally true also, right, but the, in this metaphorical model in particular, then what's an abortion? be the audience participation part. Of I mean, what's an abortion? If pregnancy is a bodyguard, Right, the person right, the person you've trusted most kind of turns on you and, and it becomes the attacker instead. If pregnancy is a project, what's an abortion? What? Laziness. Maybe it's laziness, right? Maybe it's sort of like um, irresponsibility. Whatever you've done to sort of give up, right, before it's over. Um, if, if you are, if your body is a machine and pregnancy is producing a product, what's an abortion? Yeah, and, and why, right? So all of these things, aren't we asking ourselves not about the woman who's pregnant, we understand that, but in, in these models, aren't we asking ourselves, why did the farmer do that? Why did we stop production? Why? Maybe we're feeling judgmental, or maybe we're not, but there's a question that's raised, right? We wonder, these models cause us to think and wonder a little, that's not what I expected, that's not the expected outcome. What's going on? Also, these models, something kind of interesting. They create a default separation between the woman and her baby, right? I'm the worker. My project in that metaphor, that's the one that's where they're the most sort of tight because you can imagine that maybe the project is something I'm conceiving in my mind. But I'm the farmer. There's my crop out there over there, right? Other things affect it too. I can move away from it or not. Um, um, if it, a, um, if I'm pregnant and my my body is a machine that produces a product, right? That product might be created by me, but but it's understood as its own item that's being built, right, piece by piece. So it offers this idea, this again, this below the consciousness understanding of a baby or a fetus as something that, even while we are pregnant. It is, has its own separateness, right? And you may be true, or you may not, but notice that it's there in many of these models. I'm trying to decide how to use my time best here. Um, I will say that um, one of the reasons these, have met, these models have mattered in the work that we've done so far, there'll be many others, and I'll leave that to you to think about how they may be impacting work that you care about, that the panelists today care about. Um, but one of the ways that they have mattered most recently to the work that we've done is around um, fetal personhood ballot initiatives and listening to how advocates fight for, for or, um, fetal personhood initiatives. And the logic that is contained in those arguments about what is a baby, what is an egg, right? That it, it inherits some of the logic from this idea of pregnancy. It inherits this idea that that baby, or even that egg that could be a baby, right, is something that needs to be thought of as separate. It is, in fact, even, I didn't talk about journey very much, even if pregnancy, pregnancy as a journey is a metaphor that the woman is traveling to meet the baby, so that they're sort of and at birth, this is what happens. Well, what does that tell us about the fetus? Oh, <laughs> it can saunter, it can amble, it can walk. It's got its own thing going on, right? It can, it's volitional, it's you know, animate. Again, we don't really believe that in that it can walk, but we do. Back here, <laughs> under here, we understand it that way. So when it comes to people making claims about the full personhood, or that of the fetus. There is a way that our common sense understandings of what pregnancy is impact our likeliness to be sympathetic to that kind of argument, even as we consciously reject it, or may not, may or may not reject it, but those are separate. Um, 
I'm tempted because I, we heard on the panel today that this notion that's out there that every pregnancy should be celebrated. There's actually a metaphor that goes with that too, around gift, and I'm sure that you've all heard that. That one is usually in the language very um, explicit. Pregnancy is a gift. A baby is a gift, right? And so again, if a baby is a gift, if a pregnancy is a gift, and I'm pregnant and I'm the gift receiver, then what is an abortion? Oh, thanks. Nah. Right? It's kind of throwing the gift back, which, which is maybe not, again, not what people are expecting. And one thing we know, abortion, and women in particular, anything that raises questions, anything that's a little surprising, anything that's a little not what we'd expect, that is not the default, and it's something like an abortion, right? We have this understanding of pregnancy that goes right to birth, and out comes a baby, and then we kind of stop there. We don't think about what happens next. But anything that calls that into question calls into question the closest agent, the closest actor around that event, and that's the woman. And what we do in this country is that we don't do a very good job when we question women at coming to conclusions about women, not to mention women of color in poverty, not to mention any group of women, other than just women broadly, I'll just stay there and say, when we ask, why would someone have done something like that? I wonder if we need, do we need to provide to people who need, hmm, do we? As soon as we raise questions, we have a lot of, a lot of stereotypes, prototypes, other kinds of reasoning shortcuts in this culture, I'll just speak right here, that dump a whole lot of baggage on that process. So, Again, I, I almost wish I had, I apologize for being a few minutes late and, and messing up the order. I, I that because then I could end this by saying, so look at all these challenges we have and people's default <laughs> conceptions. I'll let, leave it to the rest of the panel to solve them. <laughs> but instead, I'm saying, <laughs> what am I saying? Downer, I'm kind of saying, um, <laughs> it's about what to do at some of them, <laughs> but, um, it's a big deal. So maybe just sort of take heart that it's not you who's crazy. There's a lot going on in people's minds. All right, thank you. So our aim was to give us uh, 30 minutes for question and answer. I would just like to say uh, a very few things. One is that this, is the, this year is the 50th anniversary of uh, Griswold versus uh, and um, if those of you who know law school textbooks know that Griswold represents the constitutional end of government criminalization of the use and sale of contraception. Uh, but I would argue it's, it, it was more than that. Um, and that um, if, if you look at the case, um, doctors who had been prosecuted for providing contraceptive uh, advice raise their claims on their own behalf and, the, and that of their patients. And in examining uh, the, the U.S. Constitution from the platform of the 14th Amendment, the U.S. Supreme Court looked to developments of non-textual rights under the First Amendment and then found a right to privacy implicit in the Third Amendment's prohibition of courts in the home and the Fourth Amendment's right of people to be secure in their person seizure the Fifth Amendment's rights against self-incrimination, the Amendment's retention uh, to the people of rights not enumerated in the Constitution. When I read this as a young woman not long after it came down, this result seemed obvious to me. But I think it was the resonance with the Bill of Rights, uh, of rights with the pre-revolutionary Declaration of Independence that made it make sense to me. Um, if you look at the, because the Declaration of Independence was about the consent of the governed. Uh, and if you look at the, de the Declaration of Independence, the examples cited provide a rich inventory of the manner in which the king's govern governance ex controlled, expropriated, surveilled, and disrupted community life far beyond any reasonable bargain that a consenting governed would tolerate. The grievances speak of, of abduction, murder, prosecution uh, under false charges and not uh, before years uh, and occupation by large standing armies quartered <coughs> in homes preying on the populace. The list is long and it catalogs 
uh, practices obviously designed for coercive control. Griswold also spoke about the quote-unquote marital home. Uh, and it was at that time, and to a large extent still, that sexual, activi uh, sexual activities for child bearers was forbidden. So the idea of the marital home was the natural focus of protection for the Bill of Rights in that discussion. And here I have for a minute. We got our Bill of Rights uh, through sort of in the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, but the, do but the documents, and we, go and we basically succeeded with the revolution on the spirit of the Declaration of Independence by the efforts of all. But it was the privileged who uh, wrote our governing documents. And in doing that, they did an unfortunate thing. It may, may have been necessary, but it was a compromise, the consequences of, of which we've lived with ever since. It was the, th the Three Fifths Compromise, which gave southern states more decisional power than they would otherwise have had. Southern states would have had a 30% voting power in Congress if they hadn't had the three-fifths compromise. As a result of that compromise, we got the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, which the Supreme Court upheld, requiring free states um, against their consciences to either be criminals or to take part in the reign of terror and trauma of slavery. Although the Civil War and the 14th 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and then the Civil Rights Amendments, formally ended that legal regime, the consequences of privileging such cruelty as a national policy seems to me to have permeated everything. Griswold was followed by Roe versus Wade, which relied heavily on Griswold's privacy reasoning. Uh, the fundamentals of life are met only by complex systems of organized community. Again, in, in Roe versus Wade, doctors, along with patients, uh, provided the infrastructure of medical care, played a central role, uh, as did the accepted understanding that sex outside of marriage was, forbi was forbidden. Without elaboration and its reference to the anguish of unwanted pregnancy, the Supreme Court was acknowledging the rigid reality and its consequences for uh, that rigid reality and its consequences for, wi for women. That has softened to some extent, but it's not ended. Labor market segregation uh, is no longer uh, real, but uh, the de facto consequences are still powerfully in play. This country's never fully developed the infrastructure of reproductive health autonomy much less an infrastructure to enable child rearing without heavy dependence on women as labor that is either free or very low wage. Of course, until 1920, women, people of childbearing capacity, were not directly the governed. Instead, laws and norms operated such governed by the governed. Women could either be spinsters or the freed property of a man. Um, and either way, her economic options and life choices were restricted. When women got the vote, that didn't change. Thanks to those of us, uh, those of us who have challenged the rigid sex and gender binaries, we can now hope that more of us can experience marriage as what we were told it, we should see it as, partnership of equals. But in truth, undoing the hierarchy of being governed by the governed is still very much a work in progress. In the, in the book, The Faces of Injustice, possibly the first philosophical text to explore injustice rather than justice, philosopher Judith Sklar observed that bad outcomes are quote unquote natural disasters unless human agency is seen to be at work. Injustice is, is only seen when the human role is acknowledged. Sklar also observed that the line between misfortune is not fixed and can be the focus of intense contest. Certainly this is true in the fields of reproductive health and law. The destruction and denial of infrastructure is human agency, just as the development of infrastructure is. We are five years from the centennial of women's suffrage. I suggest that we should be asking and answering the question, what would it take 
for us to have a true consent of the governed involving child bearers. Okay. <laughs> Questions? I have a Please question. Take the mic to you so that we can. Uh, there is a case, I believe it's in the state of Kansas, and uh, uh, you could read about it in the uh, New York Times sometime earlier this week, where a 78 or 79-year-old man is charged with the equivalent of gross sexual imposition, that's probably what we call it in Ohio, is in a nursing home, semi-private room, and he came to the room, pulled the curtain around the bed, uh, the Times reported that there were sex sounds, the roommate reported that, and the DNA was taken, and it was the husband's. Uh, the, he's being prosecuted because his wife is un, was unable to give consent because she has Alzheimer's disease. Uh, let's say, you know, for the argument, let's assume that it was a happy marriage, although there could be some evidence against that because I believe their daughter is the guardian. I'm, I, you know, I wasn't planning on asking this question, so I didn't do my homework. <laughs> I'd, like your, I'd like to have the panel comment on this. This is a woman who is legally incapable of giving consent, at least the psychiatrist would say she suffers from Alzheimer's. There is no doubt it's a slam dunk case that it occurred because you got the sounds, you got the DNA, and, he, I, and he's being prosecuted. So I'd love to hear what the panel has to say about the legal and moral implications of something such as this. Thank you. Who wants to go first? I mean, I'll comment, but I only know as much as you did. I've only seen the report in the. What do you think of somebody being? Yes, I understand. I think it's very um, problematic. It's it's one mm -hmm. of the. Which there seems to be neither consent nor non-consent, right? I mean, she didn't not consent but she didn't consent. And so um, I have no idea what I would do were I the prosecutor, but, but I do think it illustrates this gap that I was trying to describe between wantedness and consent. Now, um, it, I think it's possible to enjoy sex and to even want sex, even if you lose the capacity to consent, and this is one case in which that may have occurred. It may also be that she doesn't enjoy or so what one does, how, how you go about figuring that out, other than of third-party reports or the husband's report of the marital relations during the marriage, is just really tough. But you're right to raise it. I think it's a really question. It's also one that, at least according to the Times report, is going to become much more central in the lives of so many of us as we have this aging population with longer lives. Perhaps when somebody goes into a nursing home, when they're still competent, That's they right. should sign That's a right. uh, that I will consent to have sex with my spouse even though I'm incompetent. Yeah, I mean that's uncomfortably close to an old-fashioned understanding of what the marriage of, of what you know what happens when you marry in the first place, which has not turned out all that well for married women. But I I don't know. It's other a good question. Shall we move on to another question? <laughs> another question? Um, I have a question for Alyssa. Um, so I'm curious, of course, how we go changing or um, infl I, I understand we can't get rid of the unconscious models that we have, but how we can, in public discourse, uh, work on changing them. And I was thinking about the debate around the RIFRAs. Yesterday on NPR, there was a story, I think it was yesterday, there was a story, um, this woman who had grown up lesbian in North Dakota, and how, and they interviewed her and her really conservative family, and they talked about how they, um, they loved her and they accepted her I sexual identity. And then when it came to marriage, some of them were firmly against it and said, you know, they were doing it out of love, but they still opposed the idea that she could. She said, yes, they're doing it out of love. So I can imagine all the models that are underlying that, but what amazes me is how quickly things have changed. This incredible opposition to the riffers, like in, Indiana and Arkansas, and how did how did that happen <laughs> so fast? With you know, if we have these unconscious models, mm -hmm. I don't I, I don't have the answer. I, I'm happy to speculate with. It. So how have we have been able to have so much progress with 
Well, really uh, quickly, it's so turned quickly. on a dime. Well, so I, I'm thinking this out. I'm thinking out loud right now, but I'll do that. Um, so we've actually looked at models around LGBT as well, and uh, for a partner of ours. And one thing we found is that the most problematic models of an LGBT person were actually not a person. So understandings of the of what it means to be gay, to be lesbian, to be weren't really about models of I don't even like this word, but models of sexuality, models of gayness. They were actually about models of the rest of us. They were about models of what a family is, how pieces fit together models of what society is, how the pieces of society need to be structured um, to be stabilizing, right? They were actually about um, the one, so there's one exception, which is, and I wonder if this is a piece, a piece of it, an exception that we found around a model of an actual, um, actually a model of a gay person is as we call it the, the kind of atomization model or the free radical model. So there's a model that a person who's gay Behaving as though they're sort of an independent, not really linked um, unit that's going, you know, who knows what it bumps into, who knows what it hits, it's not really moored. Um, this is a really deep unconscious idea, though, just like everything else, it can be brought to the surface. And with that particular model, um, I'm, not, I'm less surprised that models that are not directly about this in person in front of me who's gay could be overcome if they are models about the rest of us we the rest of us right i mean I'm putting that in quotes then we can say okay you know i can see how maybe my life could be different i might want think society should be different but um this particular model of kind of atomization or this free radical model something that we have definitely seen concerted efforts around right from advocates all over the place is to make clear to the public just permeate public discourse with the idea, counter to that right that claims around marriage equality right makes sense because people get married claims around adoption makes sense sense you know um that it makes sense to um not think in fact about if I'm gay, it doesn't make sense to think of me as a free radical kind of bouncing around randomly relationships that I have, right? And as and we keep hearing in all the research, the more that the more a person has a connection, right? A person who was pre prejudiced or previously very worried around these issues, the more they have connections to those of us who are gay, you know, the more that they are to shift again because we will understand it to be because of these connections and what it can overcome about other models. Can I just one thought? That seems convincing. I think, that, who asked this question? Yeah, <laughs> it seems to me it has to do with what Deborah was talking about as well, and that is the force of anti-stereotyping anti arguments mm -hmm. in American, the American legal liberal culture, that as soon as it becomes apparent to people that, um, that um, gay people, gay marriage, et cetera, is, just like mm -hmm. something so thoroughly uh, loved as the institution of marriage, then things start falling into place really, really. I mean, there's, there's, there are not significant redistributive consequences mm -hmm. of uh, accepting marriage equality. Mm -hmm. And so I think it required a sort of, a, a sort of recognition of sameness and that, and that to think otherwise is different to trigger this basic mental shift and then it sort of kicks into place. And that's not to say that there aren't Consequences that come with that, just the same as, right? Mm -hmm. For those of us who are gay, it's, uh, many of us are, are, hmm, are we really just the same? But, Correct. but that it would right. lubricate the right. process. Okay. Um, so, yeah. 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 so uh, great talks. And Robin, I wanted to pick up on yours because I in terms of international policy, uh, the heteronormativity in terms of marriage and what that relates to, in thinking about issues with regard to sex trafficking yeah. and forced marriage in other countries, it's only been recently that our federal government has put that together. So for eons, right, decades upon decades, number of countries that we have uh, intimate uh, ally-level relationships with, 
pernicious practices of girls as young as six years old being married off, and then we know what the downstream consequences happen to be, because if you're married off at six or seven or even 15, you're not going to finish school. Right. Um, there are high infant mortality rates, maternal rates, right. and so forth. But the failure to connect that is because of the, the saliency of marriage. Right. She was married. Right, and it's not until just within the last couple of years that our federal government has now begun to right. right as something that has its sort of moral wrong and is within the broader um, the the broader sphere of what trafficking is. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. I don't have anything to add, but that seems completely right. Other questions? Yeah, we have one right here in the, in the middle. Hi, Jeff. Um, there are two. <laughs> she was. <laughs> this is for Robin. Uh, Robin, first of all, that was a really brilliant speech. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about consent and, and consent with unwanted sex. I'm a little bit concerned about kind of blaming society for unwanted consensual sex. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I, I think there's a, there might be a tendency for us to get stuck there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm afraid it makes women look a little bit too much like victims. Mm -hmm. I think really the focus, and I don't know, maybe this is your next step, mm -hmm. that we have to teach the women to say, I can say no. Yeah, I wanted, that's I what wanted, I say all the time, particularly talking to teachers. Exactly. Right. I want to read uh, the newspaper and go to bed, and if you don't want to take right. me to see Phantom of the Opera, that is fine. Right, <laughs> right. You know, seriously. Um, right. And so I just, I just, I'm sure other people have raised this with you. I just wanted you to comment on that. Yeah. So, uh, look, so, so the, um, the lines of causation, I think, of why it is so many women, and quite a few men, according to a lot of these studies, particularly on college campuses, consenting to sex they don't want. Mm -hmm. I think that's really complicated and really deep and, and uh, touches on what the panelists have spoken about. But I, I completely agree with you that, the, that, that right now our response to it um, has to be directed at least significantly, right, to women themselves. But I do think that some of our national policies with, for example, um, what Michelle was just speaking of, but also more locally, um, birth control education, etc., that focuses solely on the right to use rather than a duty to use birth control. And our, our have a conversation going directed toward young women and girls about one's moral oneself to only consent to sex when you want it as opposed to when he wants it as opposed to when you think your peers think you should be having it and all of that that kind of really exists and that I think is a real tragedy so I'm gonna ask for questions I'm gonna ask for questions that uh, not that we don't want to hear more from you <laughs> no criticism implied but I'm are there questions particularly for our other panelists yeah Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat for a second because we okay. had a little arrangement. Just a quick add-on to that, and then I completely agree. I want to hear more about what Jennifer had said earlier. Just a, something for people to think about, though, in this one unwanted sex area. You know, in Jezebel, the the blog of, for young women, there's been a lot of something called quote maintenance sex, right. mm -hmm. and you know what do you in a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And what I like about that is I actually think it surfaces for me what's very troubling about this idea of wanted or unwanted sex. Anyone who's been in a 20-year relationship knows there's a lot of middle ground there. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And so what would I would say to a 16-year-old girl about you should only do something if you want it, and to someone else, well, sometimes you got to start and see how things go, and maybe you change, you know, get excited. That's a reality. And, um, and a 16-year-old girl should know that. I really do struggle with this idea of wanted versus unwanted, because to me it doesn't reflect um, Sexuality, the way I have experienced it. So Jezebel is having that conversation. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to formulate this, but this whole idea of genetic essentialism, um, the genetic entitlement based on biology and the care plus relationship issue, how does that significant rates of incarceration that we see in this country, not only for incarceration of males, also for the incarceration of females that no longer have that 
care relationship with the children. Mm -hmm. One of the kind of big unknowns, I would say, is, well, it has, has two pieces. One is um, what sort of what kinds of things count, other than money, which counts, apparently, uh, but what kinds of efforts count towards establishing a relationship with a child, uh, and also what kind of opportunity are you entitled to to try? Um, to establish that relationship, um, and then on the and you, typically for for women, um, the you know the the giving birth counts as sufficient, um, and then the question is when the whole child protection system kicks in and has increased in incarceration as sort of per se unfitness and grounds with this sort of push towards you know resolution we're going to terminate and place the child for adoption. Um, so th that's, a, that's another whole set of problems is sort of the rush to terminate parental rights in those situations, I would say. Um, and, and there's, uh, th that is a problem for the father who um, is incarcerated or just geographically somehow unable to, um, to have a sort of custodial relationship with the child. Um, but I do, but I, I, I I think it is open what it is we should require, and one of the things we should be addressing is if someone is like wanting to parent a kid and is incarcerated, like there are models for how you can maintain a relationship with a parent who's in jail, and are we willing to invest in children's lives and families that way? I mean, I think to that, but <laughs> could we work through, could we work toward a world in which we would be willing to invest in those relationships um, that would be long-term very positive so one other thing about the dads oh the the other piece of it that is actually just now starting to be challenged the um the old unwed father cases the very first one was actually a dependency proceeding in which the mother was um unfit by virtue of being dead uh so couldn't care for the children and the state was refusing to place the children with the father as an alternative um, and despite the Supreme Court saying you couldn't do that, the vast majority of states um, have, and I think mostly with now a few growing exceptions, continue to follow something called the one parent doctrine, which is if they decide the mother is unfit, uh, usually because she's poor, uh, that that's enough to terminate all parental rights, put the child in foster care, even if the father is, even if they know who the father is and he you know, has. There's Right, so, so, yeah. yeah. And on that note, I'm going to ask, is there any question going to the social welfare model behind <laughs> and, <laughs> and perhaps uh, needs some more attention? Are there any That's thoughts okay. on that subject, comments, or questions? I can add one thing on the incarceration and fathers, because um, I'm also interested in this question of fathers' rights, is that there's a second child support and incarceration that I think we yeah. need to challenge more. So as social welfare has decreased supports, um, states have used various forms of um, debt collection and incarceration, but have relied on, people rely on debt between their basic living needs and um, their expenses. And then, and then there's increasing, along with that, there's increasing um, rates of incarceration for small amounts of debt, which I think is really hard to mm -hmm. reconcile with Bailey v. Alabama. <laughs> but I don't know. How. Um, uh, um, so incarceration for debt, including child support. So fathers are defined by the ability to be breadwinners, and then be, they go to jail, and then sometimes mm -hmm. in jail they accrue, accrue child support debt, which help, you know just returns that cycle. So that's one. Um, push back here. Well, on that same thought, how does that apply to the female that's incarcerated? Um, yeah. So yeah. The, you, it often leads to termination of parental rights, yeah. um, despite their supposedly being constitutionally protected. Well, what about the provision of financial support? Right. How about her duty of financial support? Oh, you know, I don't know how that works out. Um, the woman's duty of financial report won't. Yes. Work still have, um, until the parental rights are terminated, she can have financial obligations to pay the state for foster care, which can then lead to the same cycle the same for cycle. women as right. for men in terms right. of child right. support. I'm told yeah. that we can take one more question. 
Yeah. Let, let someone get to you with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> On the social welfare model, wouldn't the European very li liberal provisions for maternity and paternity care be characterized as social welfare? So has there ever been any groundswell of support for such a generous leave program? The placing the child high on the price in any society. Yeah, I definitely agree that um, uh, so more social democratic models in are places to look. Um, and I think historically feminist advocates have looked to that. Um, w one way they looked is through universal child care. They looked at um, social democratic um, models in Western Europe as well as Israel and Soviet Union as, as models of universal child care. Um, I would distinguish between um, some countries that are more pro-natalist, which um, um, those kinds of policies help women reconcile labor force partici participation with child um, but reinforce segregation, sex segregation in the workplace. Um, so there's always costs and benefits. Um, with something like Sweden's model, where they have um, for child rearing leave a use it or lose it provision, where some of that, some of the days, you, very generous portion of time you get for a child rearing leave, with it, when a new child enters the family, um, if the secondary caregiver doesn't uh, use it, the family loses it. So that's a real a nice model of an incentive that encourages men's participation. Mm -hmm. Okay, shall we give our panelists another hand? <laughs>